Hey everybody, Norm here with Kate Sabaker, model maker extraordinaire. Kate, uh, we're gonna be doing a fun project today that you pitched. We actually, I think we talked about it last time. Yeah. Um, and it's something that you use in making miniatures and model sets. Yes. So what are we doing? So today I thought we would try out making a faux wood texture out of something as simple as gator board. So instead of uh, buying sheets of, of wood and laying out, which you, you could do. If you, you could, you could. Building. And I love tedious work, <laughs> but in case you're looking to make it easier on yourself, this is a good opportunity. When's the last time you did something like this and what was it for? Um, I did something like this about six months ago for a project I can't talk about. Ah, oh, film project, NDAs. Yes, yes but, but it's, it's it was really cool. Used in, is it for like like miniature filming and stuff yeah, like filming? Yeah, I mean, kind pr of stuff? pretty much for anything. You can do it for movies. You can do it, say, if you're at home and you want to make a diorama, say you're making a dollhouse, say you're making anything where it needs to look like a wood paneled floor, wall, etc. This is a really good option to save you time, money, effort, everything. Now, when I think of wood paneling, uh, first thing, of course, is handling, right? We have right. one sheet of gator board here, yep. and we need to make, like, sometimes paneling is not even even, like uneven paneling. Totally, totally. Uh, and then also, then, the material. Wood has grain, there's nice texture to it. Um, how are we going to accomplish all of that on something that's essentially a big sheet of foam core? Well, as you can see, I have already laid out some lines on here that will look like slats. So say this is going to be a wood floor. Um, the other side is just blank. So it, it's pretty much just fat foam core. Um, what we're going to do is paint shellac on top of it. Uh, that will help us get a texture by going back over it with a brush. And then you can go through, cut on your slat lines, put in a dark wash, and it's gonna look like slats of wood all brought together. Oh, very cool. First thing is gonna be that shellac. Um, now, you said uh, gator board, foam core, does it need to be this thickness? Can it be any thickness? You know, um, you can try it with something like foam core itself, but uh, I know that this paper that is used in this is a bit sturdier, Got so it. when you, Think about layering paint and washes and things on top of it. Uh, that's going to try and eat through the paper. So something that's as thick as possible is good. So less about the the, the foam and right. the close cell nature of it, and more about like needing some heavy carbon. Yeah, stock. it's the surface we're worried about. But what's really nice about this is because it is so thick and it's a denser foam in there, you can run this through a bandsaw. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not limited to just matte knives, things like that. And you can cut into it pretty deep and, and get what you want out of it. All right, well, I think let's get started. Uh, okay. You mentioned shellac is the first thing, and we got some right here. Yes. Uh, this is just some amber shellac. Any specific type you recommend will this do? I mean, this is this brand, the Zinzer, is pretty much what I use pretty standardly. Um, and the amber color is something I really like. I've shown some work I've done before where you can take skulls and dip it in it. You can use it for pretty much any kind of aging you want. Mm. And this will give us a nice sort of blonde wood. Uh, you can darken it up a bit with any kind of wash you put on, but again, it's a it's basically like a wood finish. So if you want something darker, you can get a darker color to start mm -hmm. with. And that's another question I have. We have the amber. We're working with white gator board mm -hmm. here. If we wanted something that was going to be a specific finish, do you start with a different base? Totally. So I've done it before where I've either gray primed it, so it has some darker colors coming through from the back, or you could paint it with the color of wood that you wanted it as the bottom as well. Uh, in what we're doing here, we're going to use the shellac as the color base. Got so it. we're just going to start out with the white. It's going to be really nice and um, bright through that, and then the wash will help us take it down a notch. And that can just be a rattle can base for the primer. Yeah, gonna... totally, totally. All right, we'll get some gloves. We'll pop over okay. these cans. Thank you. Little known fact, I'm sure I did not know this until somebody told me recently that the shellac comes from bugs. Really? Yeah, that they're like, <laughs> I don't know if it's that the bug secretes something onto a tree. I've heard that before, um, but someone told me recently, like they come from, it comes from insects. All right. I don't know how I feel about that, <laughs> but I sure do love the material itself. So with what we're doing here, we're going to take chip brushes. You can choose whichever size you want. A fat one is totally acceptable, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of it. It helps you get the most coverage at once. 
Uh, you can do a medium, a little bit smaller. I tend to lean towards something in between just so that I'm not trying to, I don't know, if I go back through and I alter some texture in one spot, I don't want it to undo something I've done somewhere else. So mm. I like a good medium size. When working with chip brushes, you always want to try and pull out excess hairs. You never want that stuck in your paint. Yeah. Um, now I actually have a trick for this that maybe I'll cover in another episode. <laughs> but there's, there's something you can do to make sure that um, none of the bristles come out. Luckily in this situation, we're looking for a textured look. So if you find a stray bristle, you can try and pull it out and re-pat it mm -hmm. and it won't be too big a deal. I can imagine in a professional essay yeah. where you want something not to have any bristles, that could be disastrous. Exactly. Um, now, so what you would do, so I kind of shake, I always shake this up a little bit before I open it. That one has been shaken already. You get your brush in there. Now this stuff will drip, so that's the only thing I say to be cautious about. And I'm going to move maybe off of the cutting mat so I don't totally drench it. Um, and you basically just start painting. Now this is going to be sort of our base coat. So right now we're worried about coverage. So just try and get everything covered with your shellac. In terms of safety for this, just gloves are fine. We're not going to need... Yeah, I mean, it's always hairs. good to, to be in a semi-ventilated area. Maybe don't go in a closet and do it. But um, for the most part, well, who knows? Everything I work with is poison, so it's possible. If you feel lightheaded, <laughs> Leave the room. Yeah. Hey, use uh, use common sense here, guys. All right, so I've got a good base coat on here. I'm going to probably start to prep the next layer. So as you can see, this is my first coat. You can still see I just made these pencil lines originally, to, and these are about an inch apart for my slats. Uh, you can do that at any size you like, obviously. You can say do what Norm said, uh, where you make maybe variations, maybe a fat board, a skinny board, and back and forth. Um, but what's great is that because the shellac is semi-transparent, I can make these lines ahead of time and um, paint right over them, and then I'll, I'll still have them marked out for me. You can see, because this is a bit liquidy, as I tilt it, it flows. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the top, yes. that's something that can actually be handy, too. If you, if you find it pooling anywhere, you can always sort of shift it around, let it move. I'm gonna start in on my second coat. The shellac says it takes about 30 minutes to dry if you're doing it for its intended purpose. Right. And adding your coats, we're not. Right. Um, so just like a minute or so is sure. fine. Sure, yeah. Let it get tacky enough. Um, and you can always, if it just feels really liquidy, if there's something in the humidity in the air, you can let it sit for like, five to 10 minutes, I suppose. But one of the tricks is that we're going to use, once the, once the shellac starts to get tacky, that's when you wanna pounce and run your brush over it to get the texture that we're looking for. So you can let it sit for a little while, but just know you don't wanna let it sit too long because once it fully kicks, then you might not be able to get the result you want. Uh, the lines, the distance between the lines you drew right now, about one inch is Mm -hmm. um, if we equate that to, let's say, a slat of wood that's a foot long, then we're talking about one twelfth scale. Yep. Um, in changing the scales, is that at this point change how you apply the shellac? Now, the only thing that I would change my technique with is when we run our brush through it to get the texture that we're looking for, you might want to. Um, something like you could turn your brush on end or use a smaller brush to drag over it because you don't necessarily want some really big fat texture line streaks going through it if it's supposed to be really small pieces. So um, I would just change your brush size and keep an eye on the different pieces. And like I said, you could still use a fat brush, maybe just change the angle of it to get like finer, closer together mm -hmm. wood grain. I like on yours that it seems like it's heavier on the, the edges, yeah. which already reads me like totally. it's a little bit like a, a wood thing. Are, are you doing things specific? Yeah. I um, Well, one of the things you do is if you start at one end and you sort of drag it to the other, you're pooling all of the color at the various ends. And one of the things that's nice about doing wood grain is wood is inconsistent. You have pockets that are darker than others. And if you wanted to, you can add those. So you come in here and just sort of like dab around and then you can try and like smooth it out, disperse it, however you like. 
there's it's sort of like Bob Ross. There's no there's no wrong answers. Everything's a happy little accident. Um, but that's something that's particularly nice about working with wood is that it's all supposed to look a little uneven. And see, you're already starting to get the really great striations there. That's like perfect. You can see there's darker spots. There's light, oh. lighter spots. It looks fantastic already. I'm at that point where I'm I'm, I'm, I'm thinking really hard about making it uneven. <laughs> How do you force randomness? I know. Controlled chaos. So see here, if you wanted to just affect the lines as opposed to how everything is spread out, you can take your brush on end and start just sort of drawing the lines back and forth. And let your hand sort of, you know, you don't always naturally draw a straight line and that's, that's how wood is. If you wobble a little, it gives it a nice little curve. And you can probably see something that I like about this process is you can see the shellac seeping through down the layer. So you can see sort of what's happening in there. I always like to, to see the process at work. Now, if this had been a thinner paper, I think probably would have started to get soggy at this mm. point. How many total layers usually you work with? You know, I usually do it until I like the color. So I'm feeling like going a little darker, so I'm gonna do a third layer. And that'll help it get real good thick. Yours is just looking fantastic, Norm. Uh, to it's me, like it's like too, before. it's like, to me, it's like so, so uneven. It's like when no, you're painting something, I'm like, this is so uneven coverage. I need to be more even. <laughs> And I guess that's what we're going for. Yep. On a production, would you do something like this at scale and like make like just like sheets and sheets and sheets? Yeah. Uh, one of the things is like, especially if you're going for consistency in multiple items, you would try to do them all together. So say I had a giant sheet of this, I would make all of it as one and then cut it apart so that that way it all looks pretty similar. I have definitely had jobs where I had to make actual wood slat flooring. Mm -hmm. I had one for uh, the your favorite movie, Oz. Oh, great and Oz great. And <laughs> and <my favorite> movie. <laughs> there is a teapot that they enter as like a house. Mm -hmm. So it it needs to be big enough that the actors can get inside of it, but small enough that it is apparent that it's the wrong scale for them. So we built this teapot and on the inside it needed wood flooring. And so I had to first just take huge sheets of wood and rip them down on the table saw till I got the right size slats. Then I had to set up a rig with a bench grinder that I could then send each of the pieces of wood through to texture it. Oh my God. Uh, and then go through and do some hand texturing um, just to make sure I had it all nice and add some you know, inconsistencies, and then we had to lay each one down and make the floor. It's like real carpentry. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> so you're not buying something from the supply store. You are totally. making your own materials. I feel like uh, with this, like a third layer I'm doing, I'm not even putting the brushes on too heavily. Like, yeah. I want the bristles to, uh, to do a lot of that work. Totally. You just want the dragging effect, really. Could you use a, a different, um, aside from amber, a different finish for shellac? Oh, of course. Um, and especially, yeah, like if you're going for something that is like a deep mahogany or, you know, like a sort of a, a darker brown, black color, you can go for anything that you want. And you can really play with it, like, like we said, by putting a base color underneath it so that mm -hmm. maybe it has some great highlights that pop through. Because you don't always want the brightness behind it. But, I mean, I actually have wood floors that look, almost exactly like this color so this works for me and it meant we didn't have to pre-prime anything and sometimes it's just whatever's the fastest and easiest works out the best do you ever work with a reference oh for stuff like this? totally and i am i mean it drives some people crazy but i would rather go into a job with as much reference as you could give me like that's it's something that i love to double check against and for the most part when i was 
doing, you know, like the big sort of movies, you're building a miniature version of something that they already had full scale. Got it. So Got it. you yeah. have to replicate it exactly. There were a few jobs where I was sort of the queen of the reference. They gave me the binder and I would like go through to, you know, whatever part somebody was working on and I have to check and make sure like, oh, actually it needed to be a little bit bigger here or the color is a little off there. So. Well, for wood, like, we all kind of know what wood yeah. looks like. But it would totally be good to have some around, especially if you find yourself wanting it to be mm -hmm. really consistent and you're yeah. like, oh shoot, what do I do here? There's something going on here. I guess it's attacking this, but I really love yeah, some of those lines totally. that's drawing in a really uneven way. Like right there, and I'm like, I want this whole thing to look like that. <laughs> and that's something that'll be really great about using the wash that we put on later is it's going to, there's probably more parts like that that you just can't see because it's not pooled enough. Oh. But once you put the wash on, it's gonna pull out all of that extra texture that's already in there. At least on mine, it's still feeling very liquidy. So I feel like I'm at a point where I might wanna let it sit for a little while just to get its tackiness so that as I go over it, it'll hold. Because right now, I go over it and I add in a texture and then you sit for a little while and you watch it all spread back out because it's still very flowy. So as it starts to tack up though, you can do that and it'll hold its shape. I feel like yours is tacking up quite nicely. I like it. And not only do I, I like that when it tacks up, uh, the streaking happens naturally, yes. like the darkened parts exactly. come out really well. That's one of the things is it's, it's not just adding the texture, but it's adding part of your paint to it because it's like it's, it's creating the difference in shades. It's giving it a really nice balance. Yeah, this uh, amber is some of my favorite. I found that, um, you know, if I have something like skeletons or what's supposed to look like old fossils or things that need to be aged, adding the amber shellac is sort of the perfect tone. And because of what you're noticing, where where it pools, it's darker, mm -hmm. it's, it's great because you can paint it on something and it will naturally flow into the crevices, into the shadows, and create its own sort of dynamic color range. It's so funny because the technique that we're gonna use is we're looking for it to get very tacky so that when we drag the brush through, it's sort of grabbing onto the shellac and pulling it and creating what would normally be a nightmare. Like, yeah, if you, shrieking yeah, exactly. Pain. If you were doing this on anything else and you went to rub your brush through it and it grabbed and it made all these streaks, you would freak out and be like, oh no, I just ruined the whole thing. But it's one of those areas in which you can take something that was supposed to be a mistake originally and find a really cool use for it. Oh my God. It's, it's like, yeah. it's transformative. It's like, yeah. as these 30 minutes of it drawing comes mm -hmm. by every, time I'm putting the brush through, something different is happening. Totally. Like I'm getting vertical streaks and now it's like clumping yeah. up. And you'll find that the areas where it was more clumped before mm -hmm. gives you the best streaks. So if you had it thicker in certain areas, which is another reason I was saying, it's good to load it on as thick as you can because then it'll just give you that much more to grab and pull through. See, that's fantastic. Now, if you say you're doing this and you got a streak that you don't like for yeah. some reason, you're like, oh shoot. One of the things you can do is with your, your brush on end, try to rework it and spread it out. You know, if there was, yeah, a particular patch that just isn't doing it for you, you can try and spread it out that way. And another thing to keep in mind is that we're going to put a wash over it. So if there's something that you just don't like, we can make sure to put extra wash in that area mm. as well. And remember that we will be cutting in notches for where the panels go. So, or, you know, the different slats. So it might be that some of the mistakes get covered in there as well. See, and this is another example of even two people doing the exact same thing and the materials reacting differently. Mm -hmm. So like mine's oh still God. very liquidy. That so cool. Yeah, right? So mine only just started doing that. So, you know, it might be how much we put on, it might be just that the material likes you more than me. <laughs> but nothing's ever gonna be the same, like the you know two times you do it, it could be totally different. So, so. if you need to make a lot, then you should really batch it and do it Yeah, all that's once. why I was saying, if I needed to do a bunch, I would do it in one big sheet so that they all came out pretty similar. Because trying to replicate on something that's 
largely based on chance <laughs> is a little hard. It's an organic process. Yeah. Now at this point, uh, before we move on, we should wait for this to dry. Yes. Right now is a good time to let it tack up and uh, take a break, go have a cup of coffee, and then come back to it once you know you won't mess it up by touching it. Got You'd it. hate to leave a fingerprint in there. All right, so I'm gonna let my sheet dry. You're gonna get yours to a happy, yep. happy place. That is already looking incredible. <laughs> wow. And I, like I said earlier, even like the places where I saw you pulling up the end, mm -hmm. those are such natural, natural curves in the yeah. wood. Well, and you can think of it as, say this is going to be a room. These are the edges where all the dust is collected yeah. and all the stuff's gotten worn out there. Oh, that's great. All right, we're going to let some paint dry, some shellac dry, and then come back and move on to our next step. And about two hours or so later, uh, we think we have some finished shellac pieces. Yeah. No, it still looks a little bit shiny to me, but you're sure that's totally okay. Totally. I mean, basically, if you touch it and it's not tacky and stick into your hand, it's good. You Great. will find that if there were areas here that were a little thicker, it might have that thing where it's like a skin, but it's still a little mm -hmm. squishy. So yeah. just be careful not to like push into it, but this is totally workable. And our next step is, uh, well, we have some blades and some straight edges. Yes. So right now, if you will recall, I had called out with lines already where the slap marks should be. So mm -hmm. now that this is good and dry, we will lay down a straight edge, cut through, and we will call out the actual slats of the wood. Um, there's a bit of a trick to it. Um, we want to cut through the surface and deep enough that um, it will sort of it'll make a good size gap, but you don't want to go very far into the foam because that's when you start to weaken the structure of it. So let's just say a good rule of thumb, try not to go more than halfway through the material. Oh, wow, but that's still pretty deep. Yeah, Much yeah. Much deeper than I thought. It's not just scoring, like right. we, are, we are cutting. I mean, you can, you can go up to halfway through. How about we say it like okay. that? You can definitely do it on the surface. I have before, you know, I'll make a slit and it just doesn't show over, you know, it almost mm -hmm. like closes back up. Right. So it could be that you make a slit and then maybe you make a second slit at an angle to, to really call out that mm -hmm. V. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's see how it goes, I say. Okay, let me give you this straight edge here. Oh, actually I have one oh, right here. You do have one? Thank oh, you. We, we both have one. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and, you know, you're using a box cutter. I have exacto, but either are fine. Totally, sure sharp. totally. So. Some of the lines will be a little obscured um, because of what we put on it, but really they're just a guide. So as long as you can see they're about an inch apart, should be good. So let's see. Oh yeah, mine's... I'm not... Not registering? I gotta push down on this, yeah. I, I think, I gotta realize that there's gonna be paint three, going in here. Three coats of uh, shellac yeah. to cut through. Wow. Oh, okay. What are we looking for when we're making these cuts? Like um, I think the main thing is that you want to see a disrupted surface where the, um, where the shellac is. We're going to go over this with a wash, and that wash is going to bring out all the lines. So as long as there's a clear differentiating line that mm -hmm. goes down there, as much of a divot as possible. So again, if you want to, once your, you know, your mark is in there, go through and add an angle, sort of go back over it, that sort of helps cut out a chunk. We want to see some white. Yeah. Right now, some of that foam. At least when you run your finger over it, you want to feel that there's a ridge and a divot. Just something that will be made apparent. And if you want to, you can test. I have a little bit of wash right here. If I rub this on top and then wipe a bit away, 
Oh, look at that. Oh, wow. So, and that is not that deep. So it's just, it's cool to test if you would like to test a little piece. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to go too crazy. Isn't that nice how it just does it for you? We're spoiling the magic of later. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the line's totally there. That's so cool. <laughs> but that's for later. Yeah. Let's but get these lines, let's not get ahead of sometimes, ourselves. Sometimes it's good to just be able to check yourself. Yeah. Because what if I sat here and I made the V on everyone and I did too much work when just scoring it was enough. So good to know what you're in for. And again, if you slip a little, hey, maybe that's where somebody uh, scuffed their shoe. <laughs> <laughs> it all was on purpose, right? It's where the wood splintered. Yeah. I definitely have places in my floor where it's like I tried to move a piece of furniture and I didn't put padding down first, just scratched right along it. That, that can totally happen here. Why not? I've already committed some crimes that I can't wait to reveal with that. <laughs> with that wash. It all comes out in the wash. And again, this is something, say we make all these slits, we go to put our wash on and you're like, oh shoot, it shows up on the ends and it sort of doesn't show up in the middle. Just mm -hmm. go back through with your knife, expand it a little and add some more wash. There are no wrong answers. A lot of times if I'm working with someone and I have to hand off a piece, like maybe I've made something and I give it to somebody else to paint, I'll say, uh, I usually let them know like the level that it's okay that something gets messed up. I'll say like, okay, now this piece literally took me days and days. Please don't do anything wrong to it. Mm. You have a few of those projects, but a lot of times I'll say, okay, I was able to whip this up really quickly. I foresee you know, you could possibly damage it in some way. And just so you know, I'm okay with that. I can, I can rebuild it. It's not the worst. Like how precious is it? Yeah, exactly. Just, just give people a heads up on just how upset you'll be if it gets ruined. Luckily with most of my work, I'm used to things getting blown up. So oh. I don't get attached to it. Can't get attached. No, I, well, I actually prefer it if it gets blown up. This was your purpose in life model. Yes. I built you for this and I've spent you know, three, four months with you and I hate you. I've been through way too much. You've done a lot of things to me. I wish you hadn't. I want to see you burn. Properly. Yeah. As long as the camera's rolling. Yeah, exactly. Not, you know, 10 minutes before we shoot, then that would be a tragedy. We did have a model one time <laughs> that in the night, it was a, a very, very large model, a few stories tall. We had parked some um, like cranes and lifts around it. Um, and in the night, one of the crane arms or lift arms had sort of given out and just oh, no. fell right on top of the model, oh, smashed in the side of it. And so everybody showed up and it was like mad dash to try and fix it. Cause we were very close to shooting at that point and had to call in people. You know, we had sent some of our crew home saying, okay, we're done with you on this job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had to call people back in and say, no, come help all hands on deck. That's a heartbreaking phone call. It is. It was one of those things where you pull up to work and you just see all these people running around going, uh oh, what's wrong? <laughs> this can't be good. Always with a straight edge. What am I doing? No free hand. <laughs> hey, you do you, Norm. If you want to free hand it, I believe in you. But yeah, I do like to use a straight edge. <laughs> well, I have that fear of like, I don't know if any of these are deep enough now. Yep. Well, just remember the real trick of it is it's not necessarily the depth, it's just the indentation it's making in the surface. So you don't even have to go much deeper, but if you go back over it and you angle your blade a bit, mm -hmm. see look here, actually this is a perfect example. Oh, I just we went can back over off. it. I just went back over it at an angle, and now that chunk yeah, has yeah. come off and created that divot in the surface. And what's cool is that that's not over the whole thing. So like this slat will look a lot deeper and darker than the others because things are not always uniform. Yep, 
Yeah, see, and you can even do that with your straight edge. You make your first line, you can go straight up and down, and when mm -hmm. you make your second pass, just angle the blade and go at a slight angle the second time. Because I did that on this last cut, and now those pieces are coming off on their own here. That's great. You just scrape at them to make them release. And again, if it's uneven, maybe there's a chunk that comes off in one part and it doesn't come off in another, then that means that they will have naturally non-uniform areas. It's just poorly built, you know, <laughs> wood house. Oh, you know the another flooring. set of wood floor that I did, probably close to this scale, was for a, it was a commercial that was supposed to be come out at um, Christmas time, so it's supposed to look like Santa's workshop. Okay. And as I was doing it, it was really fun because you make it look all whimsical. And every time someone made a little mistake or worried too much about a detail, the people would say, well, no, that's good because this is supposed to be made by elves, and yeah. they are not precise. <laughs> so it just became a thing, oh, no, elves made this. That's okay. It's supposed to be that way. I'm actually really glad to be doing some of these projects like this because these are techniques that I guess that I've been using for years that I never thought about. Like I never thought about the angle of my blade doing all mm -hmm. this, but it isn't until explaining it to somebody else, I was like, oh, okay. And they yeah. can verbalize it. Yeah. And then you all out there get to learn it. Totally. Because normally I'm sitting usually in a room by myself, not talking, just trying to make it work. Or no, I will say I do usually talk. I'm just glad there's somebody here to listen now. I look forward to seeing how these imperfections are gonna reveal themselves. Totally. With this wash. Part of me is like petrified. Can this wood look crappy enough? <laughs> or will it not show up at all? Well, and sometimes you're like, oh shoot, I can't hide it. I thought I could hide it. And, Cause you know, maybe you made a mistake in here that doesn't just, it just doesn't show up very much mm -hmm. with all of these things. But once you put the wash in there, it's gonna pull it all out. Now, another thing, um, I, I mentioned this, this is why we don't cut too deep, but you can see this now has a bit of a bow yeah. to it. That's a combination of both the shellac, which was already gonna be pulling up on the top. And now that we've added these little areas, it just makes the material want to do that. So totally. it can still be flexed. So just keep that in mind that if you need this to be totally flat, you will want to sort of attach it at the bottom or put some sort of a key that it fits into that keeps it mm -hmm. flat. But that, that curling is just going to happen. That's sort of what it does. We're cheating a material to do something it does not want to do naturally. It really is alchemy. We're turning paper, one form of wood into another form of yeah. wood. I spend right. my whole career making things look like something they're not. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have our dividing lines yep. all cut in. Uh, you've actually, like you mentioned earlier, you've prepped some of the wash. Yes. Uh, let's talk about the wash. So the wash here, uh, for me, my go-to wash is always gonna be an acrylic mix with water. Mm. It's cheap, it's easy, and I know the material. I know how it's gonna behave. So here we took a raw umber, and this was already a liquid form, so we didn't need to add as much water, but I just added some water to it. And my test for it, you can see a little here, is I just take a little bit, I rub it on the surface, I wipe it off a bit, and see if that's as dark as I want it. Because it's gonna be hard to judge from yeah. some murky water whether it's the right color. You know, if you want it darker, lighter, add more water, add more paint. That's how you do it. Um, and what's great about this is we'll just dunk our brush and put it on and you can wipe off as much as you want. You can leave as much as you want. Now, if you wanted to go above and beyond, um, this is something I've done because when you're making things, they're supposed to be a little more realistic. Um, I don't know about you guys, but on wood floors and the ones that I have, uh, they have like nail heads mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. at the part where they're sort of joined up together. If we wanted to, we could put in some cross cut lines to show right. where each board ends. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that that's necessary here, but if you, just to show you some of the, the things that are available to you, you can take a toothpick or any kind of object, maybe an awl, um, since that is wooden and a little thicker, depending on what your scale is. So just if you wanted to, 
um, you know, they're usually side by side. So I would poke a hole here. Ooh, I don't know if this toothpick's strong enough. There we go. And then at a good distance, maybe a second one here. And the trick with this is you might want to open it up a bit. Depending on what your scale is, these, these rivet marks should be a little big. Um, and you can use the back side then to open it up as mm -hmm. well. You might need the point just to cut the hole. But then that way you can scatter these around, fill it with your wash. Maybe put in your heavier stuff in there so that it looks fat. Like maybe use the proper paint itself so that it fills it. But just a little extra if you'd like to do that. That's open to you. All right. All right. If you would like to see uh, what some of this wash is going to look like, oh, let's dive in. This is the best part. All right. So again, make sure your brushes are hair free as much as you can. Let's see. And don't worry, this is a wash. It's mostly water based. If you get, look at that, that's totally black right now, right? But the point of it is to wipe some of it off. So I'm going to try and spread this out as much as possible. Maybe because of this material, try not to let too much of it soak through the foam. It might weaken it. Um, but here I've gotten total coverage. That's what's nice about working with something smaller. And just look at this, letting it sit, it's already starting to suck up. Basically, you've created this smooth surface with the shellac that the water can't penetrate through. Mm -hmm. So it's going to start to bead up. It beads up right where we've cut those panel yeah. lines. So, now, depending on what you want your wood to look like, you can go through. Another thing that I like to do sometimes is you can try to use a dry brush to then remove some of it. Oh. And then you'll get to keep some lines. But again, this sort of streaking it. If you wanted it darker like that, you could leave it. I like the idea of pulling it off a bit. I think it looks a little more natural. It really highlights those seam lines that we worked so hard to show. If you take too much off, put some more on. This no, is awesome. There's no wrong answers. This is so cool. What's great about this is that it's so easy and fast. I mean, the amount of time, first of all, the money it takes to buy this much like pre-cut balsa strips yeah. for things like doll houses, they sell it and it is expensive. Um, and then the amount of time it would cut it to, to take to cut it all to size, to lay it all flat, and then to paint it because then it's still bare wood. Right. So this is everything in one. And what's great about this is remember, it's supposed to be uneven. So like there are a few spots here where I've got some dark chunks but I kind of like it because that's sort of what floors look like. Maybe this is on a ship that has been around the world and a lot of filthy sailors and salt water and things are coming and going. The magic really here is that the way shellac dries has the texture of wood. It does. And that's why it's important to use the chip brush too, because there are a lot of brushes that are designed specifically to be very smooth and to not leave brush lines. Mm -hmm. But for this, we're like, no, we want the, the thick lines that it's going to be leaving behind. And what's cool is, you know, there are these imperfections. There are a few like little lines and dots right here that I have no idea where they came from. I didn't put them in there, but it looks like nicks that have been caught by shoes. It's perfect. I don't even want to touch it anymore. I wiped it off. It looks great. Now, I suppose what we could try. Here is something, here's an alternative for you. I did this once before and these lines were just not picking it up the way I wanted to. It, it was not um, showing up. If you want to, if you really need to bring these lines forth and you just didn't cut them wide enough or something, you can take something like a toothpick dipped into the, the full paint itself, not watered down. Um, and you can try to, you know, drag it through the line to highlight that a bit. But I think that what we've got right now is so good looking that it's not necessary. But, you know, depends on what you're looking for, how much time you want to invest. I can also flip this around 
and use it to try and maybe fill these nail heads, really call them out. Because something to keep in mind is, you know, those nail heads would not be holes in a real ship. They would be mm -hmm. flat. Yep, so yep, yep. I could take, I have this old blade right here. So looking for anything to scrape with. Get a little bit of paint on the edge and then I can fill the holes. Scrape it off and then try to I kind of really love Wipe it clean. where some of that wash is pooling. Yeah, totally. So you can see there, we have successfully filled these nail holes and they look pretty natural, I'd say. Wow. See, and it's great. You le I think I wiped off a little more than mine. Mine is more of a blonde wood. Mm -hmm. You left more in there and it looks great, like more like a, I don't know, medium, like maple-y color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. And like things like here where they're pooling, yeah. that's how it looks like I, you're getting like the knots in yeah, the wood simulated. Yeah, exactly. And that's something too, if you want to take the time, if you want to put in a few divots, maybe you go through and cut out a chunk or like, mm -hmm. Um, push down a round object around there. It's all open. It, it all looks really cool. From gator board to faux wood paneling, that could be the base for a diorama. Mm -hmm. You could make displays for your, for your action figures, your miniatures. You could make full sets with this. Totally. Uh, that's an amazing technique. I, I, I knew it looked amazing, but it's just like, it really is alchemy. It's totally. transformation. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing with us. I just want to make like wood boards all day long oh, now. Oh, totally, yeah. And if you guys try this project at home, we'd love to see any photos of any wood paneling you make with yes. Gatorboard and shellac and a wash. Um, Maybe show me some different colors because I've only been using the amber. So show me what the other ones look like. Absolutely. And we'll be back next time with another model making project, more tips and techniques. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Kate, for teaching. Thanks, Norm. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.